Mixed in the Dark. Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Mai Yang from Mixed in the Dark. For my October special, I am hosting a three-part story with two amazing storytellers. You may have heard me mention Lingva and Tales from the Abyss 87 in my past episodes. Well, we finally found an opportunity to collaborate with each other. Don't forget to take some time to explore all three storytellers' scary stories if you haven't already. The storytellers' information and social media pages are included in the description. Grab a snack, a partner, a blanket, and enjoy. This is a scary story. This is also a sad story. This story is unfortunately based on true events that happened to a family. The names of these individuals have been changed to protect their identity. All of the events mentioned in these stories are written from the memory and perspective of a 10-year-old girl. I remind you to be respectful of the experiences of the family and their openness to share this with you. This is a three-part story. You are listening to part one of three. This story begins with a house, my older sister's house to be exact. My whole family calls her Pana. Her husband and their little family decided to move to a house in Forest Lake, Minnesota. Their little family included her two sons and two brother-in-laws. Before I start, I want to explain that this event took place a long time ago when I was still young. I put together the story based on my memories of being at the house and what I was told by my family when I was young. It might be a bit off in the timeline, but it is a true story. Pana and her family moved into their new house on a very damp and cloudy day. We decided to pay a visit. I remember it was springtime. The ground was still wet from the morning rain and fog formed from the morning heat. I remember going room to room with my sisters to check out the space. The house was huge. It had six rooms, two bathrooms, a huge yard, and a lot of land. The place was pretty secluded. The neighbor on all sides were probably a good few blocks out. We walked to the backyard and found that they even had a pool and a playground. I already decided in my mind that this was going to be my hangout spot on the weekends. Pana's family lived in the house for a couple of months and made it their own. All of the family members in the house worked to pay the mortgage. Pana had a brother-in-law that lived with them named Va. I call him Zilao Va. He was usually around the house helping with chores and whatnot. Zilao Wa was probably around 20 years old at the time, and I saw him as an older brother. One weekend, I remember Zilao Wa took a trip to go canoeing and fishing with the boys in the family. I came over to babysit the two little nephews with my older sister Lily and younger sister Sarah. I remember that I was excited, not to watch the boys, but to go for a swim in the pool. My nephews were probably four and five years old at the time, so my sisters and I took turns sitting by the staircase to watch them. The pool wasn't really ready to swim in yet, but we insisted on swimming anyway. In Forest Lake, the waters don't have the same type of chemical contents as in the cities, so its water was this mucky light brownish looking color when in the pools. The chlorine didn't help turn it into a nice blue color like you would see in regular pools either. If you step inside the pool and walk until the water got to your waist, you wouldn't be able to see below your knees. We were not allowed to go past the 4 feet mark. Pana even put a long rope along the middle to mark the area where we couldn't enter. I remember my brother-in-laws came back home and it was our last day to swim. We were having a great time playing like little kids. Being the rebel of the family, I decided to go as close as I could past the four feet mark. Suddenly, I felt something move past my leg. I freaked out and gave a little squeal as I hopped back to the stairs by the shallow side. I stepped out of the pool and trying to figure out what touched my leg. 
That scared my two sisters, so they too came out of the pool to see what was going on. That was when my little sister Sarah realized that her bracelet was missing. She had a Hmong bracelet, and Hmong we call this bracelet Gautomba. It is a bracelet made of copper, given to her from my mom. It is meant to keep negative energies or evil spirits away and is not meant to be taken off. In the case that it does fall off, it means that an evil spirit is around. Something to note is that this copper bracelet is extremely hard to open without the help of an adult and even then, it's still hard. My older sister Lily went back in the pool. She walked around using her feet as a guide to feel around the floor of the pool. After a few minutes, I saw her dunk down. She came back out and headed towards us. She reached out her hands, unwrapped it, and handed the bracelet to Sarah. We were shocked to find that the bracelet was completely bent open and flat. We headed back into the house to tell Pana what happened. She shrugged it off, saying that we were probably just imagining things and that maybe the copper bracelet just reacted to the chlorine. We didn't talk about it anymore after that. That night, I had a dream that we were swimming in the pool and someone dragged my leg to the deeper end. I was holding onto the walls of the pool, trying to pull my body back to the shallow side of the pool. I was able to escape to my parents' house, but by the time I got there, my eyes had already turned a dark black color. When I woke up, it was already morning time. Pana sent us back home, and I told my parents what happened, including my dream. My mom and dad are very protected of us. I know when they're scared. In this situation, I can tell they were. They told me to calm down and assured me that everything would be okay. Shortly after, my parents called a shaman to who plead for my sisters and I. A shaman is a respected individual in the Hmong community that performs cultural rituals to heal a person or family. This event we call Hupli literally translates to calling back the spirit. It is a cultural belief that when someone gets scared, their spirit may leave their body. The objective of this event was to call back the spirits of my sisters and I in case we lost our spirits during that scare. Failure to call back a spirit may result in sickness or worse, death. A few months have passed. I don't remember visiting the house after that incident. One afternoon, the phone rang. I happened to be the one to pick it up and was shocked to find that Pana was on the other line. She was crying, and I have never heard Pana cry that hard before. She wanted to talk to my mom, so I called my mom over and stepped away from the phone. I was far enough to not be in their business, but also close enough to still hear my mom. My mom's face changed. She could totally tell that something was wrong. She told my sister to not cry and that she was going to talk to my dad and visit immediately. Later that night, we found out that our Zilova passed away. He died from drowning in their pool. Apparently, he dived on the deep side, hit his head, and passed out under the water. Zilova was a tall person, maybe a good six feet. If I remember correctly, the deepest that the pool could go to was maybe eight feet. The most disturbing part of this tragedy was that my little nephew was the one who witnessed Zilova's death. My nephew explained, I saw uncle diving, and then he fell asleep in the water, so I sat and waited. My nephew probably waited a good 10 minutes before Pana came out when she stopped hearing the splashing of the water in the pool. She has always felt guilty for not coming out soon enough to save Zilova. The Zhongma event came shortly after. A Zhongma event only happens when a family member passes. During this event, relatives are invited over to discuss and prepare the funeral. One night, my parents receive a phone call from Pana asking for red corn. In the Hmong culture, red corn is used to ward off any spirits or ghosts. It's kind of like when you use onions and garlic as vampire repellent, but in this case, it's using red corn as a ghost repellent. 
Panna needed the red corn because my little nephew was complaining that Silava was bothering him and he didn't like it. In the Hmong culture, there's also this belief that kids who have not lost their baby teeth yet are prone to seeing ghosts. We call this Chitaplinia. My mom instructed Panna to spread the red corn by the windows and doors and say, Wa, Kotu Mukola e Tachisala wa Mon King Tia, and Tia Temming Tokyo Nyotoka. Meaning, Wa, you're already gone from this world. Please don't come back to cause us any sickness or trouble. After that, my nephew stopped complaining about Silawa. Before the funeral, Pana and her husband called a shaman to look into Zilawa's death because it was so bizarre. The shaman did a ritual and reading. He found that Zilawa actually missed his time to go by a few months. When Zilawa and his family went canoeing a few months back, their canoe flipped. When the canoe flipped, he was supposed to drown that day. But my brother-in-law saved his life by diving in the river after him and pulling him free from whatever he got his foot stuck in. Here's the creepy part though. The shaman communicated with a river demon during the ritual. The canoe was flipped by a river demon who saw Va and wanted to marry him. The river demon followed Va home and eventually found an opportunity to take him with her. She was the one who held him underwater to his death in their pool. When I heard that, I thought back to the time when we were swimming in the pool after they have gone back from the canoe trip. That could have been my sisters and I. A year passed, my older sister Pana and my brother-in-law were still mourning the loss of their brother. They were also stressed from recovering from the funeral expenses and making ends meet to pay the mortgage with Dawa's help. They got into arguments all the time. Things just weren't the same anymore. One day they told my parents that they were going to sell the house. My parents argued with them to not sell the house since it had a good few acres of land and they really wanted to grow crops and farm. That house was nothing but bad memories for Pana and my brother-in-law. My mom and dad really liked the property and felt like it would be a wasted chance for them to finally have an area to grow crops and do some farming. They talked to Pana and eventually it was agreed that they would finish Pana's mortgage while Pana's family lived in our house back in St. Paul. Little did we know, my parents' decision would affect our family forever. Thank you for listening so far. This story continues in part two with storyteller Tales from the Abyss 87. As mentioned before, all storyteller information and social media pages are linked in the description.